Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Pat DeGrasier Daniels and Erwin Sturr. Coming up on DTNS, why ads in Xbox games might be a good thing, an algorithm to help identify bored students, and does Netflix's gaming strategy finally make sense? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, April 18th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Trafalino. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. We are too excited to bring you the tech news on this Monday, so let's start with a few tech things you should know. Gizmodo began publishing the leaked documents obtained from Meta by whistleblower Francis Haugen. These documents were previously only available to Congress and some media outlets. Gizmodo has since published 28 documents in the initial batch, which were reviewed and redacted by legal and academic partners to minimize potential harms and impacts to Meta employee privacy. China's National Bureau of Statistics reports the quarterly output of integrated circuits dropped 4.2 percent on the year in Q1. Uh, That's the first decline since Q1 2019 before COVID-19. And it's because of COVID this time. Continuing COVID lockdowns in China played a role in this decline with various parts of Shanghai in lockdown for around a month. Uh, And that is impacting chip production. Earlier this month, Coinbase suspended Indian rupee transfers to its app through India's UPI network. The Economic Times of India reports that at least four other crypto trading services have either suspended rupee deposits or have had banks pull support for money transfers to their platforms. Data from CoinGecko shows that daily crypto trading volumes in India decreased between 88 and 96 percent since peaking last year. Panic's Playdate handheld console began shipping April 18th. Shipments will begin for customers in Group 1 of its initial pre-order. It's like boarding an airline. Uh, And Panic estimates shipments will reach all of this group by the end of May. So it takes about as long as Group 1 takes to board an airline. Uh, Pre-orders were initially set to begin at the end of 2021, but Panic pushed that back after discovering some battery issues with the initial finished units. But it's all good now. And we're going to try to talk to Scott Johnson about this on Wednesday. App researcher Jane Mancham Wong tweeted that Twitter's edit tweet feature appears to recreate a new tweet with amended content that sits alongside the old tweet. Wong calls this an immutable approach since the same tweet idea is not used for the edited tweet. It's unclear, at least at this point, how a tweet's edit history will appear to users. Yeah, maybe they they haven't figured it out yet. Uh, All right, let's talk about Microsoft and ads. Insiders, sources, business insider is what you're probably familiar with, but they're just insider uh, in this case. They do all kinds of insidey things now. Uh, Insider sources say that Microsoft began working on a program to let brands advertise within free-to-play Xbox games. Uh, The ads may start appearing as early as Q3 of this year. This would not mean banner ads like you see in a free-to-play mobile game. Instead, sources said an example might be an ad appearing on a billboard, like in a racing game as you drive by, or some other in-game paid placement. Uh, Microsoft knows that these ads could irritate players and does not appear to be ready for an any ad goes free-for-all. They're going to build a private marketplace and only let select brands use the program. So they're being very careful about what shows up in that billboard as you're racing by. This also isn't a direct move to create another revenue stream. You might be surprised to learn this. Microsoft reportedly won't take a cut of any of this. Uh, It will also not use data from its other services like Bing to target ads in the games. This is just for the developers to be able to put ads in their own games. All the revenue would go to the game developer. Uh, One would assume this is a way to motivate developers to make free-to-play titles for the Xbox. You get to keep all your revenue. Of course, these titles also generally use microtransactions uh, in addition to the advertising, and Microsoft does get a cut of those. Um, But yeah, as I said, we might start seeing these in Xbox games as early as Q3. Now, Rich, you were looking into this, uh, and and The Verge noted uh, that they, they did have something like this briefly before yeah uh you know uh there was a defunct now now defunct microsoft owned advertising company called massive and they signed deals with ea games back in 2008 so you know a little bit of time ago uh putting ads in the games like uh, madden nfl skate nhl some nascar franchises but these were the differences here you were still paying the 50 60 bucks for those titles and then seeing those ads in there where i think being 
free to play at least i i think changes the uh the the morality of this right if you're going to be a person that's upset by it adjusts the outrage meter a little bit yeah Yeah. (laughs) well and what's what's interesting to me about this is i'm comparing this it, it really seems like they want to at least the way it's described in this article again we don't have the details from microsoft yet this is just reporting but that this feels like like almost like paid product placement in a movie which is like not my favorite thing i'm not like yay product placement but in terms of like having that or having to watch a commercial or or have a banner ad or something like that if you can organically integrate that one that might be able to add a sense of of realism to Mm -hmm. to a game where you're going to have kind of fake ads anyway i'm thinking like in a i don't know like a grand theft auto game you have tons of fake ads everywhere and that if you splash up a real pepsi billboard i don't think that's like the worst experience in the world as a as a gamer. So if they take that approach and they're being very selective and saying like, listen, these beverage brands can advertise here. This car brand can advertise in these spaces and stuff like that. If they're, if they are going to be very selective about it, I, I don't feel like I I have any issue with this. If it gets more decent free to play games out there. It also seems like, I mean, this is, this is a way for Microsoft to say developers come hang, you know, Mm. you know, let's, 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 let's make some free games, have a little fun, see what sticks. And then, you know, you you could develop beyond that. I don't, I, I, I feel like this is, this is pretty cut and dry. I, I don't know why anybody would be that outraged when something's free, you're often going to get advertisements uh, along with that. That's, that's, that's how it works. Yeah, if if it's free to play, then then your ad revenue is either the in-game payments, uh, which people have their own problems with, you know, whether it's it's pay to win, et cetera, or advertisements. At a certain point, the developer has to make money somehow. And I know a lot of people's answer is like, just charge me for it. Don't make it free. Not everybody can afford a game. Uh, you get more uptake with free to play. I feel like what Microsoft's doing here is saying, look, any of these developers could put ads in their game on their own. Uh, we're going to try to make it a good experience when they do. We're gonna we're gonna help them do it uh, and help them do it right, which is integrated into the game and be selective about what goes into the game, which is better than just you know random banner ads that that show up for for some kind of cryptocurrency you've never heard of when you're just trying to play solitaire. Uh, I, I get that some people are like, don't care, don't want ads. In which case, don't play these free to play games. I think that's that's a perfectly reasonable reaction. Uh, you don't have to, mm-hmm. or or maybe the developers can make a paid version without ads available for you. Uh, but for people who can't afford it and and don't mind it, I, I, this might be the best way to kind of split that baby. Yeah, I mean, free to play games aren't going anywhere. And like personally, not I'm not a fan of. Of, of that mechanic generally anyway in a lot of games so again like to me the advertising is is beside the point like you're you're if you enjoy a game that has a lot of microtransactions where you know you can you can invest in stuff and 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 have that experience that's great microsoft isn't like kind of getting in that way and i also think it's a really it's very timely given that you know uh over the last week or so we've talked about hey you know uh here's what's meta charging for different platforms for commission rates you know we've heard for for years now people disputing apple's commission rates on stuff like that obviously it doesn't apply to the in uh, you know the in-app transactions with microtransactions but again it's microsoft being able to talk to developers and say hey we have this very selective uh ad revenue high quality program, yeah, high quality yeah. ad ad revenue that potentially could be coming to you and by the way no commission on that Se- seems to be would be a very effective incentive for developers yeah, and Beatmaster80 uh, asks a pertinent question in our chat. The games industry is making more profit than ever before. Why should this be needed? Uh, well, one answer is, uh, would you turn down a raise? Uh, <laughs> everybody wants more money. Uh, but the other answer is, this is useful for the parts of the game industry that are just getting started uh, and just growing. Not not necessarily targeted just at EA. It it, it could be perfectly beneficial for for game companies that size, uh, but it, it helps smaller developers too. I think that that's part of the idea anyway. Well, moving on to the classroom. Lots of folks in our audience have are either in classrooms themselves or have kids in classrooms. And this is an interesting one. Classroom Technologies make software called Class that helps teachers understand what's going on when those classrooms are virtual. It can monitor how often students raise their hands. If the student agrees, see what the student is viewing, among other things. Protocol reports that Classroom is working with Intel to incorporate an algorithm that would uh, attempt to identify 
what emotions students look like they're feeling. Maybe they're bored. Maybe they're distracted. Maybe they're confused by the information that's being presented. Intel's algorithm was trained on actual students using laptops with 3D cameras. They hired psychologists as well to categorize emotions, which were then used to train the algorithm. Two of the three labelers had to agree for a label to be used in the data set. So there was no attempt to verify the labels by assessing the students' moods directly. The validity of the algorithm is meant to be found by its effectiveness in aiding teachers. In practice, it combines facial expression analysis with contextual information about what a student is working on to determine their level of understanding. Are they confused? Are they bored? Etc. Classroom Technologies plans to integrate this into the class software and test it in a college setting. And if they deploy it, the idea would be to help teachers assess how well the class is comprehending the lesson. So we called on Dave Rodbeck, psychology professor at Algama State University, to tell us his thoughts as both a psychologist and a teacher. Dave? Uh, I'm of at least two minds about this. On the one hand, in class, uh, I'll walk around and I find, I'll see expressions on people's faces when they're not wearing masks. Happily, right now they wear masks, but I see expressions even in their eyes and I see if somebody's confused and I'll say, do you want me to explain this some more? And, uh, or do you want me to look at this from, let's want me to explain this from a different angle and I'll do that. And I teach things like advanced statistics and neuroscience, things that are sort of non-trivial, let's say. So in that case, automating that is good, it seems to me. The problem is that we were told to, over the years that facial expressions are universal, and they really aren't as universal as we like to think. It's not nearly as cut and dried. This is then another place where we can let bias just creep in. And I don't want bias in automatic systems. I don't want them in any systems. But when it becomes hard-coded, that's a real problem. I remember writing my introduction to calculus midterm back in 1984. That's a while ago. And I was having trouble with a problem, and I sort of stretched and leaned back. And it looked probably like I was trying to look at other people's papers. And even if I was, I'm legally blind. I have 10% visual acuity. Uh, so this TA comes over, and he looks to see if he thinks that I'm cheating. And I held out my CNIB, Canadian National Institute for the Blind, card. <laughs> and uh, he knew then that I wasn't cheating. But what I'm saying is that we'd have to do this on individuals. You'd have to verify this on every single individual in a class. Then I think it's probably okay. But the amount of work it would take to do this would be large. <laughs> you'd have to get samples of people's facial expressions and correlate those and do a very good job of each individual to see what facial expressions mean, boredom, which ones mean I'm confused, which ones mean I just have to go to the bathroom. That seems like a lot of work. Maybe someday we can do that. But uh, I think a skilled instructor can do that already. And then there's the issue of behavior looks like one thing. It can be something else. So I think we have to worry about that kind of thing before we jump on the let's automate everything and then hard code potentially biases against, oh, I don't know, blind, sarcastic future university professors. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, thank you, Dave, for, for, for doing that, for, yeah, for giving thanks, us your reaction Dave. there. Um, you know, awesome. because he he's he's steeped in the psychology university as a psychology professor, but he also teaches. So he, he, he had all sides of the story and and really brings up the, a, a great point about the fact that we actually don't have a great sense of what a facial expression actually means. If you, if you, you know, look at the story that Sarah was telling you about, they don't go and ask the, or, or test the students to find out what they were actually feeling. They're going with psychology professors, uh, agreeing with each other, what they thought, which might not be right. Uh, given what Dave was telling us here. And, and then there's the idea of bias. We talked last week about how diagnostic assistance for emergency rooms was improved when they trained the data on the hospital's local population because the data set would vary from hospital to hospital based on the demographics of the population that hospital is serving. Uh, and I didn't see any evidence that they're doing that here. It looked like they had trained with some students and they had one data set that was meant to apply to all. And that's when bias starts to creep in yeah. when you don't train those data sets specifically to the population. I would like to see them say, well, when we deploy this in Algoma University, we're going to train it on Algo Algoma students. The other issue is, you know, in, in a, a teacher student relationship, there's a power dynamic there, right? Like the, the teacher is the authority figure the the students aren't. And when you are giving this, this information to the teacher, I was thinking about this the more I read about this. And I think there could be a utility for this, even if it wasn't a localized set, which I still think is the ideal 
scenario, right? Where it's like in, it's individually trained on you, stored locally, and then they mm -hmm. can run an algorithm on that. But if that's not the case, give that information to the student, right? Say like, hey, we've noticed that it seemed like maybe you were confused by like, especially when it comes to confusion or like comprehension, like based on how you were interacting with today's lesson, seemed like maybe you weren't, you know, you, you weren't getting full comprehension. Would you like to reach out to the teacher in this case? Doesn't automatically report it, you know, doesn't make it, doesn't make you like complicit for not understanding or like feel Man, like that would be a great way to, to train yeah. the data too, yeah. is to get the, the, the students confirmation of their feelings involved as well. Yeah, I, I think that kind of flattens and makes it less problematic from a power dynamic level if there is any bias. And yeah, to your point, I'm being able to report back on it. Yeah, because otherwise, if if the training data were good and it was good at accurately uh, assessing confusion, I think it's a great tool for the teacher and, and not really surveillance for the teacher to go like, oh, this is reminding me that that person may need an extra explanation, right? It's what Dave was saying he can do in person mm -hmm. would be helpful. I, th I think that's super helpful. He's just, you got to get it trained well. Well, folks, if you have a thought about this or anything we talk about on the show, uh, email us. Let us know. And if you're like, great, I'd love to. What's your email address? You never say it. Well, I'm going to say it right now. Feedback <laughs> at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Email us. Do it. I've been trying to guess Netflix's path forward with its gaming strategy since it launched the gaming strategy. Uh, Netflix, if, you, if you've been following this, you know, is allowing you to play its games there's like a dozen or so mobile games and a, I think like a couple others. Uh, you just log in with your Netflix account and you can play for free. No additional charge. Put it that way. So far, it's mostly been those mobile games. Uh, they are mostly unrelated to their TV properties. They have a couple Stranger Things games in there, but those were adapted from the show after the fact and not made originally as part of Netflix gaming. Now we have the first example of Netflix directly tying a game to a new show right from the start. The show is actually based on the card game Exploding Kittens from The Oatmeal. Uh, the show is coming in 2023, but first, almost a year before that, a mobile game developed along with the show will launch this May, along with two new cards related to the game and the show that you can get for the actual card game. The TV series is being produced by Greg Daniels, you know, the guy behind The Office, uh, and Mike Judge, uh, the, the guy behind Beavis <laughs> and Butthead. you've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're teaming up on this. Uh, they're not the showrunners, but they're the executive producers. The story will involve God and the devil being sent to Earth in the bodies of house cats. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's off to a good start. <laughs> 100% in. Yeah. Uh, the game will be separate from the existing Mobile Kittens game. There's a mobile version of the card game that'll still exist, that'll still have its own universe. It'll be separate from this Netflix version. The Netflix version will be based on the TV show. This is what a lot of folks expected Netflix to do with gaming in the first place, though. Tie in a TV show to the games. But this is a card game that already has a mobile game being adapted into a TV show and a second version of a mobile game coming off the TV show. So it's a little more complicated than I would have expected. Um, is this the best first shot for Netflix or is this a great way for the company to learn how to do this? Gosh, I mean, I, I mean, besides the fact that I love the premise of this, of this game uh, and I'm a Netflix subscriber, so I could, you know, have some fun with this. I'm, I'm still, We've been talking about Netflix getting into gaming for months. I, I don't know. I mean, close to a year at this point. And there's nothing that really at least has stuck out to me as far as, you know, me kind of surveying the scene, you know, on the Twitterverse and, and, and beyond of anything that has really, you know, captured the hearts and minds of anybody who uses Netflix. It just seems like a, you know, it's, you know, a playground. Um, this could be the first part of that, um, uh, first part of something being the, kind of like a viral game that, that drives new people to Netflix, or at least keeps people hanging out at Netflix because that's the whole point, right? Netflix has a lot of competitors now. Netflix is, is trying new things in order to, you know, get new subscribers and keep the existing subscribers they have. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if Exploding Kittens is it, but I mean, I it, this is my wheelhouse. Uh, you know, if you if you if you made any game, this would be the game that I would play. <laughs> the what's interesting to me is, 
I, I, I remembering when Netflix first got into original content, right? And it seemed like, especially for outside of maybe not Lily Hammer, for like House of Cards, like that was like algorithmically generated to be a hit, right? Like they took like, they, they did all their customer data, like, all right, the people, you know, this actor, this setting, this style, this director, okay, we're going to put all that together and it's going to be, this is how, boom, this is going to be our tentpole, uh, like high prestige show. And it seems like while the idea of, of gaming with original content, like kind of pairing those two together, it would seem like that's a great way to introduce new IP before maybe a show hits. Like if, if you're doing this kind of release schedule, this is the way to do so in a way that we can out, like we've correlated that people that love exploding kittens also 95% of them also are huge Mike judge fans and love that style of humor and love like the stuff that he is doing there. So it's like, yeah. this to me is like, we have, we have found all the things that will make the hit. Uh, we have we have found like a, an already pretty rabid audience uh, for, you know, a, a very popular party game uh, with, a you know, with established a name that's going to say like, hey, this is good. They're going to get it. They're going to get the same style of humor as, you know, we come to expect from dude behind the oatmeal. Now I can't remember his name. Uh, and so like to me, this is like the safest possible way to do this, even though I, I do think I'm mean, as you were alluding to that, like this is very clearly like an original IP like. Uh, a way to introduce that pipeline going forward, it seems like. Yeah, it feels like the more I think about it, it's smart not to turn Bridgerton into a game, <laughs> not to turn Stranger oh Things into more games. <laughs> Please don't. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, create something from the ground up that lends itself to a game so that the mm -hmm. game and the TV show are developed from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And a card game that has an interesting story premise, which is what this sounds like to me, uh, is an excellent way to do that because you've already got a built-in fan base for the card game. They're going to want to watch or at least try the TV show. Yeah, they might be more willing to play the mobile game, although it's a little weird that there's going to be another mobile game version yeah. of it. Um, but but yeah, I I think the next step from this would be to say, hey, Miller World, uh, which Netflix owns, can we create a game based on your comic? We did it on a card game. This is what we learned. Let's try it. We'll, we'll create a game based on the comic and turn the comic into a TV show. Uh, I could see that that's starting to feel like a logical way for this to happen. Yeah. And increasingly Netflix and uh, Roger, I know we've had discussions about this on past shows. Like Netflix is increasingly like an IP factory. We're like well, that, that's their, that's how they're going to, whether it's original content, whether it's now increasingly games, like it, this very much feels like we're in the business of creating IP and, that you will increasingly diversify the way you consume. And I mean, this is the great thing. If, if you focus on the IP, whether or not it, it, it succeeds as a video or, or a series or not, it's it's less monumental. Well, we still have an avenue of making this a game, or we have an avenue of taking this IP and using it for something else. So, yeah, it doesn't pan out everywhere, but it doesn't mean we're taking a loss on it, but rather we can have a commodity that we can then look and turn around into a different thing. We, we see this with uh, video games and soundtracks, right? There are lots and lots of great music that are churned out, created just for video games, but they find a second life, not just as original soundtracks that you download for consumers, but also for use on Firstcom was uh, basically licensing out the soundtrack from Medal of Honor for people to use in documentaries or their own shows as bed music if you want something that sounded very World War II, you know, narr narrative style like you know a very solemn moment we have a soundtrack for that you want something you know it's all very action and we have a soundtrack for that so it, it's really just stretching out what you can do with the same ip and and the metric for success for netflix is subscriber uh signups and retention uh so if you are expanding that ip like you're talking about roger uh and people love it then you've got now you've got two reasons for the exploding kittens fan to stay subscribed to netflix or to sign up uh, to Netflix. They don't even care if you never play the game or watch it, as long as you love it enough to think, well, I wouldn't want to be able to get, you know, I wouldn't, the game especially is something like, once you've watched the TV show, you've watched it, you're waiting for a new one. Whereas the game's like, yeah, but I might want to play it again. Uh, so that, that that's an interesting play for, for retention. Well, you might wonder, you know, what are QR codes really good for? And the answer may be college football. The Verge noted on sportslogos.net that this spring, the University of Central Florida, or UCF's football team, will use QR codes instead of numbers 
on the back of the player's jerseys. The front will still have their number. So numbers aren't going away, but the QR code will be on the back. QR code links to players' biographies on UFC, uh, UCF's website, you know, that include stats like how old they are, how tall they are, where they went to high school, etc. If you're thinking, uh, wouldn't this be hard to scan? They're running around a field. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Appears UCF will also display players' QR codes on the home stadium's Jumbotron, so that, if you're really interested, that might make more sense. You might recall last year, the UCF Knights, as they're known, kept the numbers on the back of their jerseys, but swapped their last names for Twitter handles. So they're pretty forward thinking. Yo, oh, they, they, they are. Uh, I, I, forward thinking is a way to say it. You might also say uh, great at getting attention <laughs> from people. You might. The other way. Because mm-hmm. you're right. Like the QR codes... Even if you're in the stadium looking up at the Jumbotron video, uh, I'm imagining this is most useful for people at home. Even then, trying to get your camera out, point it at the screen in time to catch the QR code and click the link during even a slow motion video replay uh, seems totally unwieldy. It's totally unuseful. Uh, Having them up on the Jumbotron seems more useful, which you wouldn't have had to put them on their jerseys at that point. And it's going to definitely make the referees' jobs harder because yeah. they're going to have to everybody flip over so you can yeah, see like, their number. Who are you? Yeah. You have to wear <laughs> AR goggles to, uh, to read the QR code. <laughs> that's to uh, Ooh, that's Magic actually, Leap is going to sponsor yeah. this team. <laughs> that kind of, that kind of, turn, yeah, it turns it into a new little rev stream. Get your hollow lens mm-hmm. and your you surface know, tablet. Let's, to go. let's, let's make the refs uh, do their <laughs> job better. Kinda All right, let's. Actually. Uh, we have no QR codes in our mailbag, as far as I'm aware. Is that correct, Sarah? Uh, it is correct. But Desmond, uh, from what feels like summer in Richmond, Virginia, as Desmond says, says, I was listening to your conversation about AI art in episode 4253. As an instructional designer, I've used images from this person does not exist to provide pictures in my courses instead of using stock images. Oh. I emailed the creator one time about copyright and he told me he believes AI created works that can't be copyrighted and I was free to use them however I wanted. This is a handy way for me as an instructional designer to make my courses richer. Well, the courts may or may not agree with him, but at least that means he's not going to go after you, which is uh, a good first step on the copyright. And I love this example. Uh, thank you, Desmond, because because we were wondering last week, uh, and they were wondering on the Tech John too, like, what are these used for? Like, why would you want AI to create art for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is a, a great example, right right from a, sure. an actual artist who, who you I might mean, think would be threatened by this, but instead is using it as a tool. I mean, listen, if you, I don't know, right now, if I needed to get some sort of a stock image of a man on a skateboard, you know, it, it, it and it looked like he was in Florida, or whatever, like Getty images would be the first place I would go, but you can, it, that's not free. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, I can see certainly in a scholastic um, uh, situation where this, this actually might make a lot of sense. Yeah, making making stock art for people that that has you know that is cheap to make because he didn't pay an artist and copyright free because well or at least copyright ambiguous at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, we have a brand new boss to thank. Cyberhound Tech started following us over the weekend. New patron just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you so much, Cyberhound Tech. Great to have you on the team. Indeed. Get in get in there and join Cyberhound Tech. We won't even make you put a QR code in the back of your uniform. You can just no. join on in. Unless you want to. And yeah. if you do, it's that's to totally cool. And we'll try to scan it as you run by. Uh, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Live folks know that it starts right after we finish this show. But just a reminder, DTNS is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow doing it all again with Nate Langston joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>